Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Seiko. I'm the Deputy Director of the National Center on Improving Literacy, and I'm thrilled to welcome you today to the Educators Science of Reading Toolbox series, How to Use Systematic Phonics Instruction in Your Classroom. I'm also happy to introduce our presenter for tonight, Ms. Mary Murphy Stowe, MED. She works with teachers, administrators, instructional coaches, directors, and coordinators of special education through the Training and Technical Assistance Center at William & Mary and the Virginia Department of Education as an educational specialist. Mary is certified as a SIM, Certified Learning Strategy Professional Developer, Certified Local Letters Classic Trainer, Letters Third Edition Facilitator, and a SIM Content Enhancement Routine Professional Developer in Training. As a Technical Assistant Consultant, Mary supports the National Center on Improving Literacy and Educational Testing Service. Currently, Mary is a doctoral candidate in special education and serves as the president of the Virginia branch of the International Dyslexia Association. Thanks so much, Mary, for being our presenter tonight, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. I am so pleased to present this particular Educator's Toolbox this evening because it is just so timely for all of us to begin to think about this. So welcome to How to Use Systematic Phonics Instruction in Your Classroom. This particular toolbox is helping us understand how to present systematic instruction in one of the five big areas identified through the National Reading Panel Report. Phonics instruction teaches the idea that letters and groups of letters or graphemes match individual sounds or phonemes in printed words. The ability to apply these predictable relationships to familiar and unfamiliar words is crucial to reading success. Systematic phonics instruction begins with teaching letter to sound correspondences and progresses to regular and irregular word reading. A link has been placed in the chat to the Ensel and ten, uh, brief and I'm sorry, it's difficult to see that with my screen um, in the blur mode. So I apologize for that. But I also want to let you know just a little bit about ENSEL. It is the National Center on Improving Literacy, as Sarah shared. It is a partnership among literacy experts, university researchers, and technical assistance providers with funding from the United States Department of Education. You can find us through our website that provides a number of resources. You can find us on X, formerly Twitter, and then on Facebook as well. Our learning intentions or outcomes this evening are to support an increased ability for you to use systematic phonics instruction in your classroom, but also to increase, hopefully, your awareness of some of the ENSEL resources for implementing evidence-based literacy practices. We hope that as a result of tonight's session, you will be able to accomplish these two items. You'll notice that a link to a Google folder has been placed in the chat as well. Within that Google folder, you'll receive the PowerPoint from the, tonight's presentation. You'll also receive a list of all of the links um, and then the document from the ENSO website. And then if we don't have time to answer all questions, I'm happy to respond to them in writing and place that in the Google folder as well. So let's move forward in beginning to understand systematic phonics instruction. So we begin the journey in thinking about the alphabetic principle. We move from phonological awareness to reading words, and that's what we really need to appreciate in regard to thinking about phonics instruction. The alphabetic principle has two parts, as you can see on the slide. First, alphabetic understanding is knowing that words are made up of letters that represent sounds in speech. So that's a really important concept for us to think about is that the letter or grapheme actually represents the sound. The second piece that we need to understand is phonological recoding. And that really is knowing how to translate the letters in print or words in print 
into the sounds they make to read and pronounce the words accurately. Despite the presence of irregular words, learning the alphabetic principle thoroughly and using it to read unfamiliar words is a much better strategy than trying to memorize how to accurately read each word as a whole word. So a strategy I used with some of my students was to take, or even teachers, when I taught phonics instruction, was to take this dictionary, this is a single dictionary, very old, but a single dictionary, and ask them if they would like to memorize all of the words in the dictionary. Of course, the answer was no, um, which brings us to the piece of beginning to understand that we do need to teach the alphabetic principle um, and involve that in phonics instruction. So this is a much better strategy for beginning to understand how to read words um, and then read connected text. And it's a much better strategy than even guessing words from the first letter in the word or other strategies that might be ineffectual. Okay. Again, a link has been placed in the chat to take you to the Ensel um, brief on alphabetic uh, phonic principle. Excuse me. Now, let's talk a little bit about explicit phonics instruction. There are three pieces here I would really like to talk a little bit about. The first one is teaching students to connect letters to their most common sound or sounds. So all 26 letters within English make at least one predictable or common sound depending on the other letters in the word. In some instances, a letter or grapheme may make up to three sounds. Also, teachers can uh, sequence and deliver instruction in a way that helps students efficiently learn the rules or conventions that surround the pronunciation of those sounds or the, the sounds within the words. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second piece, teaching students to read words using what they know about the sounds that letter makes, letters make and the letter combinations. So when using the alphabetic principle, students blend the sounds or phonemes made by individual letters or graphemes into whole words. Students begin to learn to read by producing the individual sounds in words and blending the sounds together quickly to produce the whole word with simple CBC uh, progressions or words moving to much more complex word types. And we'll address that a little bit further and look, about, look at that a little bit um, it more in depth as we progress. The final piece is that during instruction, teachers might use a strategy such as I do, we do, you do. Some of us know that as the gradual release model, but we would model for students what they are to do. We would practice with students what we expect them to do as well in combination, but then we do need to see students um, do this work independently as well. Finally, we need to think about having students begin reading text that contain a high percentage of decodable words. So early in learning to read, students can begin reading simple books that contain words that they can read in, on their own because they understand the alphabetic principle. Decodable texts have a high percentage of words that are fought, that follow common alphabetic principle conventions, which makes this easy for them to decode and read these books on their own. Many common words such as was, said, or of are irregular words. Um, and so we must teach them the phoneme graphing correspondences as well there, but we make sure that we teach these so that they can recognize them in the decodable text. You will notice that another link has been placed within the chat so that you can read a little bit more about matching books to phonics features from the reading, reading rockets. Next, and this is in the ENSEL Educator Toolbox document that you can download from ENSEL um, on the first page. These are tips for teaching letter sound correspondences. So let's examine these seven tiles for just a moment. The first piece is that we need to, um, with a few sounds, learn a few sounds at a time by teaching each letter 
or letter of the alphabet or in the alphabet, and their most common corresponding sound. So that's important. We want to teach just a few sounds initially, but we want to teach them with their most common sound. Then we want to, moving to the next tile, when we do teach those few letters, we want to make sure that we teach the letter sound relationship in our instruction, but we also need to teach the naming of the letter and teach the sound that it represents as well. Uh, following further into our instructional sequence, we may want to provide a picture of an object to remind the student of the beginning of the sound and the beginning letter of the object would remind them of the sound. Some of us have referred to them as keyword and sound um, pre, uh, pictures, but we also might want to think about that in relationship to our instructional sequence. So we've taught them the most um, common sound that the letter makes. We've taught them the name of the letter and the sound that it makes again. We've provided them an object or a picture to remind them of that uh, sound. And we might use an image of a pig. If we use the image of a pig, then the, the letter that we're being reminded of is the P and the sound that we'd be reminded of is if we look at the next tile, we may want to even say or tell the students a very short story. So we might use an alliteration to be able to help students be continually reminded of that sound. And so an example that was provided is Polly Pig likes to eat pizza and play with her pals. So what you notice is that we've used that sound repetitively throughout the story to help the student remember the sound of the letter that we have taught. We make sure that we uh, introduce the upper and the lower case at the same time, or not at the same time, but as well in that instructional sequence. We want to make sure that we provide multiple practice opportunities. And because there's no specifically agreed upon instructional sequence for introducing the sound letter sound relationships, we need to enable, we need to do this very systematically and with a structure that we have noted here so that students will be able to begin reading words as quickly as possible uh, because we've introduced the letters and a few letters with a vowel so that they will be able to begin to read words very much um, more quickly. And so we begin with a letter sound relationship of high utility or high frequency sounds. Some of those might be mm or ah or s. Now you note that those are continuants and that's going to be important in just a moment when we move further. But we want to do that so that students will begin to read words much more quickly. We might separate and stagger letter sound relationships that are auditorily confusing. So think about b and v. Those sounds might be confusing for students if we teach them side by side. Think about b and d. Again, those sounds might be auditorily confusing, um, but they also might be visually similar. And we want to make sure that we, we separate those in our teaching sequence. But once students master sounds spelled with one letter, more complex letter um, relationships can be taught, such as SH for SH, or A consonant E for A, or IGH for I. You notice those are digraphs, a syllable type, and then vowel teams as well. So let's begin to think about regular word reading. And for this section, we're going to focus in on an IES guidance document that is called Foundational Skills to Support Reading for Understanding in Kindergarten through Third Grade. And for this particular um, uh, session, we're going to focus in on recommendation number three. Recommendation number three, indicates that we should teach students to decode words 
analyze word parts, and write and recognize words. This particular recommendation had very strong evidence of support, and so it's important and critical that at the early grades, we do teach students to decode, to analyze, and to write and recognize words. Again, in the chat, a link has been placed to this IES practice guide. So in addition to the practice guide and the focus on recommendation number three, we want to suggest six action steps for accomplishing this task. So when we look at action step number one, we teach students to blend letter sounds and sound spelling patterns, but we do that from left to right. So we begin that early instruction of directionality for students so they begin to understand that we're reading from left to right, but we're teaching them to blend letter sounds and letter spelling patterns um, in a recognizable uh, pronunciation, but from left to right. Action step number two is really to instruct students in common sound spelling patterns. Action step three, teach students to recognize common word parts. And that uh, particular action step really grows over time because we move from maybe syllables to morphemes. And we'll talk about that progression in just a few moments. Action step four is have students read decodable words in isolation, but also in text. Both are extremely important for practice to automaticity, but also to be able to recognize text, um, recognize words in uh, connected text. Action step five is to teach regular and irregular high frequency words so that students can recognize them efficiently. And then finally, action stop Action step six is to introduce non-decodable words that are essential to the meaning of the text as a whole word. And again, we'll talk about each of these with the subsequent slides. So let's begin to think about action step one and begin to think about blending. So blending can be very difficult for students. They may be able to segment the sounds, but then blending them back together may be a bit of a challenge. So blending really refers to reading a word systematically from right to left by combining the sounds of each successive letter or combinations of letters. And we want them to do that quickly. We need for them to practice that. So I invite you to follow the process that's noted on the slide. So you'll note that it's sound by sound, sound by sound, then recodes. We move to partial blends, and you notice onset and rhyme piece, and then to whole units. So after students have blended the sounds together to read the word, they should then read it the fast way or in a fluent voice without holding on to each sound. We may have them hold on to sounds initially, but then as we become more rapid with the reading of the word, we'll hold on less to those sounds. Unitization is a critical developmental process in the word reading development uh, stages or processes. Students who approach the nonsense word fluency task at a more advanced unit level or the whole word level may be categorized as in the full alphabetic phase. Many of us will recognize that as Aries phases of word level reading development. But if they're able to do that, they are quantitatively and qualitatively better readers in the middle and at the end of first grade on an oral reading fluency measure. So what's important is that these skills are taught early um, and that we teach them in a systematic manner so that students can pick up on this process. So let's also begin to think about the blending progression. So you, we noticed or talked a little bit about blending being difficult for students. So we want to start that process in a, um, with the simplest piece and moving to the more difficult piece. So when we talk about blending progression, the first um, letters that we want students to blend together are really those that are continuous or produce continuous sounds. So let's think about the word sun. S uh, mm. 
each of those, you can sustain the sound for a little bit and blend it into the next sound. But then next in the progression might be to have a stop sound at the end of the word. So let's think about the word mat. And I invite you to try pronouncing that yourself. Mm, at, and we stop with the stop at the end. But then we move to the next place in the progression, a stop sound at the beginning of the word. In some instances, we may do that um, with stops at the beginning and the end, or we may just have a stop at the beginning. So let's think about the word cat. K -at. And in that word, we do have the two stops, one at the beginning and one at the end. But then the most difficult is going to be a stop sound in the middle of the word. So think about the word stop. <laughs> st -ah. So we have the t as a stop and the p as a stop. And so this is our progression that we want to think about. We also need to then think about in the progression sound by sound blending and then spelling focus blended when we move into multisyllabic word blending as well. So another piece to think about, because we emphasize the need to be able to read text um, from decodables, is that the decodable text in most programs do not include stories with consonant, vowel, consonant words at that early blending level. So you may need to begin to provide sentences to your students and give them an opportunity to read the sentences, thus having connected text to be able to use their blending strategies at, at those early levels. One thing that I might do with students or have done with students is that we create our own sentences and then we together and then we read those sentences back so that they have that experience of reading in connected text. So I invite you for a moment to examine the words on this continuous blending example. Um, and let's think about where in that progression that I just provided for you, these words might be. So if you look at man, mm, ah, mm, then we are in all three, we're in that very early stage where we're blending all continuous sounds. But then we move to sat, sat. We're in the next stage. And then cat and so on. And then with the final word, stop on that top row. So I invite you to look at the others and see if you can identify what are other words within these examples that um, are examples of all continuous sounds. I know that you can't respond to me, but I'll give you a moment to think about that and see if you can identify where all of the sounds are continuous and just maybe say it to yourself and then I'll confirm. So if you identified run and sun, then you would be correct in that. So let's now think about a stop sound at the end. I've already worked with sat. Is there another one with the stop sound at the end? Cat is one, there are others as well. Where is the stop sound at the beginning of the word? Yes, bag and job, but you also notice the stop sound at the, at the end for some as well. But what about the stop sounds in the middle of the word? We've already discussed stop. You might notice step. You might notice spat. And you might notice skip. And again, remember that this is the blending progression. I'm going to present one more slide on this progression that's just another visual to help support our understanding of this progression. So you'll notice with the first tile, consonant, vowel, consonant, continuous sounds, consonant, vowel, consonant, stop sound at the end, consonant, vowel, consonant, stop sound at the beginning, and then finally, CCVC pattern with beginning blend and stop. 
So two sounds at the beginning, the vowel sound, and then the uh, consonant or stop sound at the end. So I invite you to look at the table that's on this page. I know that's a lot for us to take in on the slide. The main purpose of this particular slide is to show you a list of words that might be used for the purposes that we've been talking about, teaching students to blend with that first step um, with the phonics instruction that we're going to provide following the recommendation. This gives us a progression of words. This particular table can be found on page three of the Ensel toolbox. You've been given the link to that toolbox previously, but when you have access to the PowerPoint, there's a link at the bottom of the slide as well. But again, you notice that it follows the same pattern that we just provided in those various visuals that we used. First, we have all continuous sounds. Then we have stop sounds at the end of the word stop sounds at the beginning of the word, and then beginning blend, and includes a stop sound. So let's move on to step number two of recommendation three. You'll notice with this particular step, we're to instruct students in common sound spelling patterns. And we provided part of the chart here. The uh, entire chart can be found on page 25 of the IES guide. And again, that link to the guide was provided early in the, this webinar. But when we look at this particular chart, we notice that there are consonant patterns that we need to teach students, where we teach the consonant digraphs, the trigraphs. We need to teach students the blends. We need to teach students the silent letter combinations, um, which are tricky for students. But then we also need to think about those vowel patterns that occur with vowel teams, vowel diphthongs, and then the R-controlled vowels, or bossy R, we might call them. But then look at the multiple representations of long E, the multiple representations of long A. And we need to make sure that students are aware of these common sound spellings, but we would teach them in a hierarchical fashion where we move from the very, very simplistic to the much more complex. The other piece of this chart are the syllable construction patterns that we might teach. And so you, you saw one or two noted here, but then there are others that students would be introduced to as well um, so that they would begin to recognize those patterns and they would begin to recognize the common sound spelling patterns rather than memorizing this entire dictionary of words. So let's begin to think about step three, where we're teaching students to recognize common word parts. We talked about that syllable type piece um, in the previous slide, but that could uh, continue over to this slide as well. But here we're moving from syllables into morphology or into morphemes, where we have displayed meaningful word parts. And so we've moved to another layer of the English language. We've moved to Latin and Norman French, and then we might even move on to Greek, you know, combining forms as well. But here we have a representation where we have a prefix, um, a root, and then we have a suffix. Okay. And I didn't do that left to right for you to see. So we have a prefix, a root, and then a suffix, un being the prefix, read being the root, a bowl being the suffix. And you know that each of them has meaning attached so that students will be able to not only learn the syllable pattern, but will begin to learn the meanings of each of those uh, word parts as well. So one of the methods that we might use for step number three is to provide a learning sheet for students where you might give them the root and then they begin to understand that they can add a prefix at the beginning, they can add a suffix at the end, um, and that the suffix might be derivational or inflectional, and that the prefix is, der is derivational, but then they'll begin to see that interplay with all of these meaningful word parts 
words and that we can manipulate them to change the meaning of the word or to enhance the, the, the word or change the tense of the word, a number of different items that we can do to a word by adding these meaningful word parts. Luckily for us, um, some researchers have uh, provided for us what some of the most common prefixes and suffixes are. So we're going to begin with the 20 most common prefixes. And what White, Soul, and Yanahara noted is that these 20 prefixes more account for 97% of the prefixed words that appear in printed school English, which is lovely for us because it provides a way for us to instruct on the 20 most common. You notice that they're listed in order of frequency, and so we would probably teach the most frequently occurring first. Another piece of this is for us to understand that approximately 50% of all English words can be spelled accurately by sound symbol correspondence patterns alone. And that another 36% can be spelled accurately except for one speech sound, and that's usually the vowel. So that, that produces 86% possibility of being able to decode or predict the pronunciation of a word. Um, Hannah, Hannah, Hodges, and Rudolph have done some of that work for us as well in helping us understand the patterns and that English really is predictable enough for us to be able to teach. The other list that we've been fortunate to gain as well, uh, White uh, et al. research began to give us suffixes and the uh, 20 most common suffixes. We see that they are also listed in order of frequency. And so it provides for us a way to teach the most common, the most frequently occurring so that students will be able to read um, words made up of morphemes much more quickly. And when we teach prefixes and suffixes explicitly, this helps to make decoding new words much, much easier for students. And it also helps make the connection to meaning. And so students may be able to predict the meaning of words, which is our hope and our goal. So let's begin to think, and I'm not going to show the video. There is a video on the on the slide. It is a bit lengthy, and I know that we are um, really stressed a little bit on time this evening. But what I will do is go over the instructional process. The video link will be placed in the chat for you, but also you'll have access to it on the uh, PowerPoint. But when you think about this instructional process for teaching recognizable common parts, you see that we're going to circle the word parts, looking for the prefix at the beginning, looking for the suffix at the end, and then other familiar parts that we might see. And we underline the vowels within that middle section. We say the different parts of the word, re, vis, it, ing. Um, and then we say them again fast together. Remember, we're blending, revisiting. And then we're going to read a sentence to make sure that it makes sense within the sentence. In the video, the sentence they use is, we were revisiting our past by talking about our memories. And so in this instance, it did make sense. Another way to begin to think about this is through the lesson plan and how we might introduce the teaching of word parts and predictable patterns. So we would certainly look at providing a word list. We would draw the student's attention to the feature that we were referring to with this particular list. Here we notice that it's oi, and so we would teach that oi says oi, we would read the words, we would pronounce the words together, we would decode them, we would blend them back together, we would practice reading them to automaticity, and then we would practice them again another time. But we then also want to make sure that students practice reading the words in context. So you see that we have connected text passage provided within that lesson plan as well. 
There is again a video available. A link will be placed in the chat for you to access that later. It's also available this particular lesson plan on page 28 of the IES guide. So I will not play the video this evening. It is fairly lengthy, but you will have that available to access later. Okay. So the other thing, um, we're now on step five. And we need to think about teaching regular and irregular high frequency words so that students can recognize them efficiently. Efficiently is the key term here. This particular chart is within the IES guide as well. But we notice that the regular words on the side, we would definitely teach those. We would teach those through some of the patterns that we would teach. But then when we move to the irregular words, we have to think about we need to teach a way for students to analyze the words, but then practice those. So there are a number of strategies available for doing this. Um, one might be the use of heart words that some have talked about. But we also want to make students aware that some of the portions of the irregular words are predictably decodable, so they are partially decodable. But then they may be irregular phonologically, but orthographically, they may follow a regular pattern, such as said, even though phon phonologically it's pronounced differently than it is displayed, but it follows the pattern of moving from present tense to past tense, say to said in the spelling, as pay to paid and lay to laid. So some strategies that are provided for us within the IES guide are ones that we can help students use when they need to learn high frequency words, but particularly high frequency irregular words. But I want to make sure that when they move to the flashcard activities, they have practiced the word analysis strategies. Um, that support their understanding of the structure of the word. But then with this particular strategy in the four steps, you add a word as another word has been mastered or several words have been mastered. And then they do use a token system to reward students for being able to master and accomplish the pronunciation and the memorization of those particular words so that they'll recognize them efficiently and automatically when they read text. So let's talk about a couple of word building activities that do appear within the Ensel toolbox. Um, and this particular strategy you might have referred to here, we refer to it as word ladders. Um, others of us may have seen it as word chaining or sound chaining. So let's begin to examine the activity as it's presented to the students. So when you're building activities for students to use, you want to begin with words that contain simple patterns, even as simple as vowel consonant, moving to vowel consonant, vowel consonant spelling patterns, and then even more complex patterns. You notice here that we, with all of the patterns, we have the consonant, vowel, consonant patterns. And I'll invite you for a moment to look at the progression. We begin at the bottom. We move to the top. And with cat to can, we're asking the students to change one sound. And it's the end sound within that, within cat. We're asking them to change the last sound from t to n. Mm. In the next box or the next higher box, we're asking them to again change the last sound from n mm to p, but we would say can to cap. Then again, we're asking them to change another letter, but we're moving to the beginning of the word where they have to change k to t. And then you can see the progression throughout. At one point, we actually asked them to rearrange the letters and create another word where the beginning sound is what was at the end previously. And then we might move to the change of the vowel sound. Another activity that is provided within the educator toolbox is one where we might use sound boxes. Some of us have referred to them as Elkonin boxes, and they can be used for students who are learning words with two or three sounds using the set of boxes. If they aren't solid in their letter sound relationships at this point, they can use disks to move into or chips 
I've even seen matchbox cars used as well, moving into those positions as you pronounce the word or as you move through the pronunciation of a word with students so that they begin to learn to segment um, those uh, the sounds into their individual sounds and then blend them back together. What you notice is that arrows appear at the bottom of those boxes so that even though we're segmenting those sounds, we're blending them back together as well. And this would make great practice for moving from that phonological piece or phonemic awareness piece into the phonics piece as well. So if there are any questions, we're going to move into a couple of other items. But if there are any questions, we'll address those in just a few moments. But I would like to talk with you for a moment um, about the possibility of targeted technical assistance requests. They have begun to launch a new targeting targeted TA tool for stakeholders. You're able to use the QR code if you find that you might be one who might need um, to ask for targeted technical assistance. If you submit through the link your information, then someone from ENSEL staff will get back with you and discuss what your request is. So I've invited you to think about your questions. And so I'm gonna to move to the question slide. And if there are any questions, I think Sarah or one of my other colleagues may have been collecting those questions. If we have time to answer them, um, I'm happy to do so. If not, I will respond to all of the questions in a paper document and place that in the Google folder. Great, Mary. We had one question that came in early in your webinar when you were talking about alphabet knowledge and phonological recoding back in the beginning around alphabetic principle. And the question was asking if then you would introduce, for example, the uppercase letter T with the lowercase T and a visual Q. I've seen that done in many ways um, in many different instances. And so in one instance um, where I have seen all of those pieces introduced at one time. I've seen it introduced where the lowercase letter was presented, the uppercase letter was presented, a keyword was presented, and then the letters here were introduced as you might read them. And then here they actually introduce cursive. So I think the, the thing that we need to think about is what would the student encounter most frequently um, and so I might introduce one piece at a time. Certainly I'm going to introduce the letter formation and then the sound. I'm going to probably introduce the lowercase letter with the sound. But I also, when I do that, want to uh, introduce the name of the letter, but then also the uppercase version as well. Um, but I would do each of those um, not all at one time, you might do it within a lesson plan. I know that Judith Birch, um, within um, a book that she has written in Shedler and Birch um, lesson plan, they have provided a systematic way to introduce those and they use uh, sound cards or sound decks for doing that. And then they also might uh, use a keyword and sound uh, deck as well. So there are numerous ways to go about doing that. I've seen them presented all on one sheet. I've also seen the sound cards presented or a keyword and sound card presented both with lowercase, but then you may want to introduce the uppercase as well so that they understand that that letter can be seen in various forms, but that the sound of that letter is this um, consistently because we want to teach the most frequently occurring sound symbol correspondence first. Um, and if someone could indicate whether that actually answered their question or not, um, that would be great. Great. Thanks, Mary. That's the only question we had come in at this point. 
Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to move forward then um, and invite you, if you would, to complete an evaluation. The link will be placed in the chat, but there's also a QR code here. Um, if when you leave the webinar, it's my understanding that the QR code will appear so that, or the evaluation form will actually appear as you leave the webinar. But for those not on the webinar, if you would follow the QR code, I'll leave it up for just a couple of minutes. And then because the link is in the chat, I'm going to move to the next uh, couple of slides. We just want to make sure that you're aware that we will be doing this on a monthly basis to review all of the educator toolboxes that are available on the ENSO website. So in July, you'll hear more about how to build fluency with text in your classroom. In August, you'll learn about explicit vocabulary instruction and how to build equitable access for all learners. In September, you're going to learn more about intensifying reading uh, instruction for students who are not making desired progress. October, best practices for improving language and literacy outcomes for English learners. And then in November, you'll learn about using an infographic to learn about critical role, the critical role of phonological awareness. So those are the upcoming sessions that we invite you to um, attend. And then again, you can find us on Twitter or X, Facebook, and then YouTube as well. So thank you so very much for joining us this evening. We really appreciate your attendance this evening and your kind attention. So thank you again.